Welcome to the Glam Life Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Glam, and I've coached hundreds of beauty business owners to scale and expand their businesses. I did this myself with the Microblading Institute and Brow Sister PMU products, and I've created this podcast to help you turn your business goals into reality. this episode, we're going to be talking about starting a beauty business. Now, as I've just mentioned, I actually own several businesses, so I think I know a little bit about this this subject, but starting a beauty business can be very rewarding. It can be incredibly exciting, especially in the beginning when you first get the idea and you start acting upon it. That's when people are loudest, right? When you say, I signed a lease, yeah, I'm starting a business, whoop, 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 whoop. I, I took a class and I learned the thing, look. People say, let me know when your books are open. And then those books open. Do we have a crickets noise we could play? <laughs> it can be a very exciting business venture, but it's a lot of work, honestly, and nobody's going to do it but you. No one's going to do the work for you. There are many factors to consider, okay? From choosing a business model to sourcing products and supplies, marketing, promoting your business. So where should you start? Like what's square one, right? When people say, oh, right back to square one, what is square one? Here are a few key steps that I want you to consider when you start thinking about opening your own beauty business. Number one, you got to figure out your target market. Who is your ideal client? I, If I've said this once, I've said it a million times. I talk about ideal client until I'm blue in the face. This is the first subject that I tackle with newer artists whenever I begin um, coaching. If we're together three months, four months, six months, a year, I really hope we're not together a year. That's a very long time to be talking about the same goals. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's usually the first thing that I ask you. What do you do and who do you do it for? Who is your ideal client? When you, by the way, and this is something we can talk about on another day, when your marketing, when your social media posts speak to everybody, you are talking to no one. No one hears you. But... Let's say we're, let's picture this way. If you're in a crowded room and a couple people are at your table all having a conversation and you just start talking, nobody's listening to you because they're already having their own conversations. But if you lock eyes with Brittany across the table and you guys start having a conversation, only Brittany's listening to you, but Brittany is listening very intently and she's hearing every word. That's how you should speak to your ideal client. So you need to figure out who your ideal client is and what services and products you're actually offering them. And and to figure out what services and products you wanna offer this specific client that you wanna work with, you need to figure out how your services and products meet her needs, which means you gotta know what are her needs. So when you're thinking about who your ideal client actually is, you gotta think of what are her problems and how can you solve them? Yes, it really is that deep. I know someone out there said it ain't that deep. It really is actually. It is called sales psychology and it really is. It's important to have a clear understanding of your target market. This is going to help you guide your business decisions and then kind of tailor your marketing efforts. So we're not out here, my my friend Sheila calls it spaghetti CEOs. I'm not just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. This is a targeted marketing plan. This is an idea. This is chess, not checkers. Do you think Kris Jenner accidentally birthed four millionaires and two billionaires? No, that was no accident. That was a targeted marketing strategy. When, when, she, when her, you know, how do you say that? When, uh, when she struck gold, when the iron struck, when her ship came in, whatever, she seized upon the opportunity, but she did so very calculated. People say the devil works hard, but Chris Jenner works harder. Well, that's true. I've never seen the devil. I've only heard of his works. But I can't turn on the TV without seeing Chris Jenner. The devil works hard, but Chris works harder. And that doesn't mean she's an evil woman, by the way. It means she has strong work ethic. I know some people get confused by that. Um, yeah, I I want to be, a lot of people say, oh, I wanted to be the Kim. Then a lot of younger girls wanted to be the Kylie. But if we're honest with ourselves, like nobody really wants to be Kylie anymore. But um, yeah, I would still love to be Kim, obviously. She has a nice life. I really want to be Chris, though. I really want to be Chris. Balenciaga fucks up. Nobody's calling Chris. Maybe Kim is, but everybody was in Kim's comment sections, brrr, holding her feet to the fire for a company that she's related to. Well, so is Kim. So is Chris. Nobody was. Nobody was hitting up Chris. 
Chris gets to have the best of both. You get the best of both worlds. You know why? Because she's insulated herself. She's not the product. She's the driving force. And she's the one pulling the strings. She said it herself. And and Kylie has voiced this before too, saying that Chris says this all the time. She says, if someone tells you no, you're talking to the wrong person. That is all I needed to hear to know that Chris is the driving force. That's why she gets her 10%. That's who I want to be. That's my role model. Some people say, yeah, well, she pimped her daughter out. Maybe, but the video was already out. So again, when her ship came in, she commandeered it. She steers those sails into the wind and she takes that ship where she wants it. Kim may have gotten famous off of a sex tape, but that's not why that family is still famous. That's not what they're even known for, to be honest. And and a lot of people made sex tapes that were very famous. Look at Pamela Anderson. She had the first one, arguably the first sex tape, celebrity sex tape, and and she got nothing from it. Not one dollar. Ever. Uh, Paris Hilton, Kim's direct predecessor, uh, she, yeah, she made money off of it, and she still has lots of money, but... she didn't feed her entire family off of it she's not a billionaire her siblings didn't become billionaires because of it it was a targeted marketing strategy you take the first piece of fuel and you run with it you build the fire bigger and bigger Um, by the way and this is something we can talk about another day but this is exactly how you get big on tiktok you strike it rich one time and you spin your gold into more and more and more. You spin all those stacks of hay into gold, right? What was his name? Rumpelstiltskin. So yes, you need to know exactly who it is that you want to work with. That's your target audience. And then you need to know what do they want from you and how are you going to give it to them? What are their needs? It's important to have that clear understanding of your target market. It's very important because it's going to help you make every decision in your business from there forward. Next, we're going to choose our business model. There are lots of different ways to have a business, even a beauty business. You can have a brick and mortar salon, some states for various things. You can have mobile services. You can rent a room inside of someone else's salon, which often means cutting down overhead with things like um, inspections, insurance, occupancy licenses, on and on. Or you can have an online store if you want to own a beauty, like, um, I don't know, like a, what would you call that? Like a beauty um, supply store, let's say. Or if you want to have online webinars, online courses, if you want to open up your own mentorship, you can do that virtually. I mean, there's just so many options. You should consider all of those factors, like who actually is your target market and where's your location. So when I first decided that I was going to start training, not just providing services, training I actually had a little bit of fear in me because I live in the middle of fucking nowhere. (laughs) I mean, in my state, I'm actually the third biggest city in my state, but I'm number three on my own home turf, on my own home turf. So where does that put me on the the nationwide stage, you know? Well, if we're honest with ourselves, 50, you know, hindsight being 50, 50 or whatever, but I'm, I'm the national, the national education ambassador for my national board but I wasn't at the time and I was thinking to myself nationally I must rank pretty low when it comes to permanent makeup education because there's no like there's nothing that special about me versus people who have been doing this 20 years and have traveled the globe and spoken on big stages and blah 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 blah, and live in Miami or New York or LA or Vegas, or anywhere else that you actually want to be able to write off a trip to, right? So I had some real insecurity about that. You have to take two flights to get to me. You got to really want me to come train with me. Damn. And I'm, you know, at the time, my kids are still little, but at the time they were very little. We're talking two and months, two years old and then a few months old. So I'm thinking to myself like, There's no way that I'm going to become a travel trainer. And by the way, it's kind of like being a stewardess. It sounds glamorous, but yeah, fuck that. I don't want to do that. (laughs) Not for, no, fuck that. So if you're, if, if you're one of those trainers who's like, eh, it's a two day course for thousands of dollars. And we can talk about that another day as the national education ambassador. 
flush that shit down the toilet. But if they're doing that and they're going to these hotels and it's a different city every three days or whatever, that's not a lifestyle that I want to participate in. That's not a very, first of all, it's not even that profitable. Um, it, or let's say this, it's not a sustainable, profitable business model. And secondly, like you're going to feel so burnt out so fast, traveling, 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 traveling. It's almost like, like being a rock star, but without the fame, like fuck that. I don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, choosing your business model, you really have to think about who's your target market and where's your location. I forged ahead and was able to use really great marketing to reach my target audience anywhere and start creating really good, really customized courses, but I still had a slow build because I still had to build the reputation. Yeah, I got a couple fish on the hook that I could reel in, but then I had to cook them up real, real, real good to prove that it was worth the two flights to get to me. Yeah, you might be interested in coming take a one-on-one with me, you and one other person. So I got to do it up big and I got to really put on a great show to differentiate why it's worth taking two flights and a full day's travel to come and train with me in the middle of nowhere, you know? But I did that, and I became the national education ambassador. (laughs) Anyway, let me stop divulging myself and get back to you, you and your business model and the things you should consider, right? So um, when you're choosing a business model, like I said, there are many things to choose from, whether that's going to be a brick and mortar or a mobile service or an online store or whatever. And you're thinking about who's your market and where are you located and where is your market. So if you want really high ticket services, but you live in, I don't know, I don't know. Anything you say is going to offend someone somewhere, right? Let's say like Saskatchewan, man. Like I, I think I would take a trip out to Saskatchewan because I think it's funny to be like, yeah, I had to go so, I had to go all the way to Saskatchewan. There's nothing out there, I know, but except for this training though. But I, that's very niche. So I don't know that you could build an entire high ticket service market there. So let's say that, okay? Then you might consider, hey, with my location, I'd probably do much better focusing my efforts towards my ideal client where they actually are. I want to meet the client where they are. They're not here in Saskatchewan. They're on TikTok. They're on Instagram. So that's where I'm going to meet them and I will sell to them in the virtual space. I can sell them virtual coaching. I can sell them products online that I can ship out. That kind of thing. That's what I mean by consider who they are and where they are and where you are, right? Your resources are the thing that are are going to be the deciding factor for you when you're choosing your business model itself. So next, you're going to have to source uh, products and supplies. And that doesn't only mean if you're selling products, right? Like, let's, let's forget about online clothing stores and beauty stores and products and all that stuff. You have to have them even if you have a brick and mortar because you got to have the stuff for you at your shop. Once you know what products and services you actually are going to, what products, let's say, you're going to be offering for the services that you want to offer, then you have to source them. You got to figure out how to knock off as much overhead as possible without incurring the fees of a bunch of middlemen. And spoiler alert, if you're ordering all your stuff on Amazon, you are in fact incurring the cost of a middleman right then and there. Forget the fact that the manufacturer probably well, we'll call it the brand, may be a middleman. Like they ordered it wholesale direct, slap their own name on it and are selling it to you for an upgraded fee. But then they put it on Amazon and now you got to pay Amazon a fulfilled by Amazon fee. I know, I have an FBA account. So um, what it saves me in operating my own warehouse as a small business is fabulous. But I do pay a fee for it. Certainly, I do pay a fee for it. Now, currently, the margins that we're working with, FBA makes sense for my business model, but you need to know your numbers to know that. And you don't know somebody else's numbers, so you have no idea if they're slapping a gigantic charge on you to cover FBA or if they're, you know, just basically just getting by when you're ordering product and supplies off of Amazon. But anytime you're working with a big box retailer and ordering things, um, from that retail price rather than wholesale price, it's likely costing your business a little bit more. So you need to weigh the pros and cons of that. Is this something you could source on your own? Is this something you can reliably, consistently 
source on your own and can you cover you know often that means that you have to order it in very very large batches so can you store it can you use it before it expires can you you know like there's a million questions but I would do this if I were starting all over I would do this immediately with uh paper towels any paper products because they don't expire right and I have a huge warehouse now at my at my stop at my store so I have um plenty of room to store large cases and cases of trifold paper paper towels for the bathroom uh paper towel rolls near sinks um tissue toilet paper on and on and on I would not do this with let's talk about my product I would not do this with numbing cream because yeah I could sell 500 tubes this month that'd be great but are are you as a business owner who does not sell product but instead is trying to use it are you going to use 500 tubes of numbing cream this month no okay then you're going to waste your money because it's going to expire so then retail might be a better choice for your business's overhead so it, it's important and I know I know it feels so cumbersome it feels like damn I'm really majoring in the minors here to go through every single product and decide if I want to try and track down a wholesaler that I can purchase this from or if I why can't I just like put it all in my Amazon shopping cart and buy it because I don't want you to waste your money that's why it you know twenty dollars being the difference between wholesale direct and a retailer adds up when it's across 50 products yeah yeah I'm right I'm right aren't I so You really have to um, decide how much you have to spend and where you want to spend those dollars and and what's going to make your dollar reach the farthest, basically. In addition to that, you're also going to have to buy things like salon equipment. You're going to have to maintain it. Um, So factor that into your budgeting as well. And and all the other overhead, right? A lease, insurance, licenses, renewals, continuing education, marketing materials, on and on and on. And then, of course, it all comes down to the, 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 the Bible, right? The Bible. The Bible of your business, your marketing plan. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's such a reflex for me. Your business plan. <laughs> your business plan is like a roadmap for your business. It outlines what are your goals, who's your ideal client, what's your target market, um, Financial projections, really, truly knowing your numbers is so important. And I feel like no one does this work. And then, of course, your marketing strategies. There should be a general marketing plan listed in there. It's a good idea to create a business plan before you actually start your business itself um, because it's going to help guide your decision making and keep you on track. So you'll always be talking to that ideal client. You'll always be focused on the end goal at the end of the day. And it's it's right there in the, the Bible of your business, right? And then finally, launch it. But you need a launch plan. I go into great detail in my coaching about launching. Launching products, launching courses, launching businesses, relaunching, rebranding, the whole thing. It's, you're throwing a party, man. It's like throwing a party. It's very calculated. It's very Chris Jenner of me, okay? Um, launch and promote your business. Once you've got your business up and running, promote it. Promote it like you cannot breathe if you're not talking about your business. This could involve things like, um, of course, you're going to need a website or a landing page or something. You must have a social media presence. You must. I don't want to hear that your mom's sister's best friend has had a business doing hair for 40 years and she doesn't have an Instagram account. Of course she doesn't. You know what else she has? A bunch of dead clients. Sorry. Was that shocking or jarring to hear the word dead? But it's true. Over 40 years, many people have come and gone in her salon. They have all spread her name through word of mouth and many of them are gone. So she probably has a pretty quiet salon. And if she doesn't, then what she has is an influx of new hairstylists who promote themselves on social media. And that doesn't mean that they dance on TikTok. That simply means that through high school and college or beauty school and every year after that, they have continued to maintain and create friendships on social media so that when they do post that they're at work or when they post a piece of their day they are advertising their business to people who are relevant purchasers in your town that's what that means 
That does not mean the salon doesn't have social media, so you don't need it. It simply means she outsourced it to her renters or her hairstylists. That's all that means. You must have a social media presence. Used to be you could take an ad out in the phone book. When's the last time you saw a phone book? You could take an ad out on local television. Well, guess what? Your local station is now nationally owned and you cannot afford it and no one's watching it anyway because we stream on Hulu and Netflix and Paramount Plus and and Peacock and everything else. No one's watching regular television and certainly not your local channels. Okay, radio gets results. That's what they say, right? Yeah, cool. Spend some money on that. But you know what? I haven't listened to radio in two years. I have Sirius XM and everybody else is streaming everything. We're listening to Spotify and Apple Music. I don't think anyone's listening to Apple Music. We're listening to Amazon Music. We're, we're not listening to the local radio station. So that's not where marketing is anymore. Get a billboard. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking. There's a million signs on the street. That billboard is just one of them. And it costs a lot of money. And the same people drive the same routes every day. And they're looking at their phone while they're driving. Literally, you spent $3,000 on that billboard for a year. And they're seeing my marketing because they're watching reels while they drive down Ambassador Caffrey. (sighs) You're not hearing me. You have to have a social media presence. I'm so sorry. I know you don't want to. I know you feel like it's a whole nother job. And it is. That's why they have social media managers. But that's a conversation for another day outsourcing your social media it is what it is man you have to have a home on the internet you've got to be digital so you need at least a landing page if not a full website you need social media presence and um if you're newer if you're just starting then running some kind of you know time constrained promotion would be great I also think networking um, is very important. Relationships are very important. I I talk at length all the time till I'm out of breath about having no competitors and only colleagues. I think that's so important. But it's also really important to represent your business in places where you're not asking for money. People shouldn't only see you when you have your hand out. People should see you handing things out. This is how the cartels, I'm so sorry, but it's true. This is how the cartels are so beloved. Yes, they commit mass atrocities. Yes, they contribute to the downfall of society. Sure. But they also hand out a million dollars worth of school supplies every year. And those are the people who will keep their mouth shut. When they see something, they say nothing. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. So I'm not telling you to go out and commit crime. What I'm saying is when you're seen as benevolent and kind and giving back to the community you work in and ask for money from all the time, buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit, book with me. When you then turn around and ask for nothing, but simply give, run, run a Toys for Tots donation center at your shop. Costs you nothing, brings people in, lets, lets you see new faces, and it benefits someone. That's so kind. Start your own, you know, um, you don't have to start your own private charity, but let's say uh, you start your own like donations list. You start collecting donations for St. Jude once a year or you organize some kind of um, a team that goes and walks for Susan G. Komen or, or breast cancer and you can wear your logo on your shirts. That's fine. It can say Microblading Institute all over it. Let them know who's doing the good work. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Catholics love to say you're, you're supposed to do all of that uh, quietly. And that's okay. You can do that privately. But when it's for your business, if you want to write off your business expenses so that it doesn't actually cost you any money um, and, and everyone benefits from whatever charitable works you're doing, I say go and do it. You know what I like to do? I like to go to my old hood, the old stomping ground to the Boys and Girls Club, and I like to simply talk to young girls about business ownership for free. I don't ask for anything from it for free. But I tell them where I work. First of all, it's important, right? I have to edify myself. I have to tell them, hey, I, you should listen to me because I've done X, Y, and Z. I own this and you can look and see. I'm successful at it. You should listen to me. But also, um, you know, I'm proud of what I own. And I'm proud that I'm able to be in this position where I can give back to other people. And I'm not asking them for anything. Girls at the Boys and Girls Club are not coming by eyebrows from me tomorrow for $650 a piece. They're just not. But that doesn't matter because it's not my goal. My goal is to give back. 
and, and to foster goodwill and to let people see that I'm not a money-hungry monster who drives a Porsche and owns commercial real estate and I'm better than you and my thumb is on my nose with my pinky wiggling at you. Not at all. Not at all. I'm very, very thankful. I know that I didn't get where I am without the help and benefit of my community backing and supporting me. And I think that's a really, really important and very much overlooked component of opening a business. People get so mad when they feel like their best friend, their cousin, their sister, their the girls they went to school with haven't bought enough from them. We saw this with the MLM girlies, right? They all started saying, I'm not hitting my goal this month and I'm a locally owned beauty business, but you want to shop at Sephora. Yeah, because we don't want $60 eyeliner that costs $2 to make because there's six middlemen in between. Get out of here, girl. That's, that's white on white crime. You know, my limbs, get out of here, girl. But we heard that same, you know what it sounds like? You know what it comes off as? Entitlement. Stay humble, girl. Stay humble, girl. Thank your clients. Thank your clients. Foster goodwill. Know who you want through the door. Know what the offer is. Be very clear about that offer. And then go talk about it. Market it. That's it. It's pretty simple, honestly. And um, if you want to continue this conversation, you can always find me on Instagram at victoria.glam. And until then, I will talk to you next week.